French. And it can be ordered also through my online bookstore in French, OK? And in that book, Molana has very beautifully, very beautifully explained the two sequences in the Quran. There's that sequence, which is the chronological sequence, which is the first revelation which came down, and the second, and the third, and the fourth. Why did Allah send these revelations at the beginning? And why did he send those at the end? Hmm? What is the significance or the implication of this chronological sequence? And then there is a second sequence that he would, that Jibra'il al-Islam would instruct the Prophet al-Islam that this revelation is to be put at the beginning of the Quran, although it came later. And this revelation is to be put at the end of the Quran, although it came first or came second. Hmm? This is the arranged arrangemental sequence of the Quran. And in this sequence, Surah Al-Fatiha is at the beginning because it is with this that you open the Quran, Fatiha, opening surah. And it is this we open every surah of the Quran. And the last one is Surah Al-Nas. Hmm? This is the arrangemental sequence, and that is the chronological sequence. And if you want to understand why there are these two sequences, read Maulana Fadlur Rahman Ansari's book, The Quranic Foundations and Structure of Muslim Society, in two volumes. So our question that we asked was, why did Allah wait for 13 years in Mecca? He never sent down the fast of Ramadan. It would have been manifestly beneficial for us to be fasting in Ramadan in Mecca, but he never sent it down. So we never fasted for Ramadan. And then I pointed out to you that we then made the hijra, hijra meaning the migration. I have to translate these terms because, mashallah, we have non-Muslims who are listening to the lecture now. Many people who are Orthodox Christians are now listening. And we welcome you, brothers and sisters. <coughs> Excuse me. We made the hijra or the migration from the, Mac the city of Mecca to the city of Medina to the north. And when we arrived in Medina, we stayed, we lived in Medina for 17 months. And still Allah never sent down the fast of Ramadan. We pointed out to you on the last occasion that when we arrived in Medina, we found a very large, significant, influential community of Jews living in Medina who worship one God. Mecca was pagan. Mecca worship idols. But these are Jews who worship one God, like we worship one God. The Bible says, the Bible says, the Bible says, No, O Israel, the Lord your God is one God. And our book says, Kul hu Allahu ahad. Say, He God is one God. And there's so many rabbis in Medina. The most important of all the rabbis in the world are there in Medina. In French, they say, La creme de la creme. The best of them all were there in Medina. And when we arrived in Medina, we fasted with the Jews on the days when they fasted. And in accordance with their law of fasting in the Torah, which was that you begin the fast at sunset when the day ended, and you continued the fast all through the night and all through the next day until sunset, 24 hours. No food, no drink, and no intimate relations with women, with, with whom it is lawful to have intimate relations. Mm -hmm. That's another subject. Another time we could explain that subject, who are those women with whom it is lawful to have intimate relations? Not today, not today, not today. 
we fasted in accordance with that law of fasting uh, for 17 months. And still Allah never sent down the fast of Ramadan. It is only in the second Shaban in Medina. Only then did Allah send down the revelation. فَمَنْ شَهِرَ مِنْكُمُ الشَّهْرَ فَلْيَسُمْ Whosoever witnesses the month of Ramadan, this is Shaban, next month will be Ramadan, فَلْيَسُمْ So we have to fast for the whole month of Ramadan. Why did he do it now? Is this by accident? Is this by chance? Or is there an explanation? That is what we wanted to know on the last occasion. We said that Something else happened in that Shaban, you remember? Or have you forgotten? We said that Allah changed the Qibla. The Qibla is the direction. Qibla means direction. And in here, in this context, it's direction for prayer. Direction for prayer. So the Qibla was Jerusalem. And for 17 months that we were in, in Medina, after the hijra or the migration. Yes, we prayed in the direction of Jerusalem. Are you listening in the Balkans? Are you listening in Albania? Are you listening in Montenegro? Are you listening in Serbia? Are you listening in Bosnia? We prayed in the direction of Jerusalem because that was the Qibla. And when we prayed in the direction of Jerusalem, we had to turn our backs to the Kaaba. No Arab could do that and survive because all the Arabs venerated the Kaaba. This is the center of the world. When they would leave Makkah, they would take some of the stones from Makkah, carry it out. And then they would make tawaf around those stones wherever they were. And so those stones begin to be venerated because of their love for the Kaaba. And then they will take the stones and start to carve them. <laughs> and then they'll make an idol and bring it back to the Kaaba and put it. That's how you got uh, 365 idols in the Kaaba because the love for the Kaaba was such. This is the heart, the spiritual heart of the whole Arab world, the Kaaba. In Makkah, built by Ibrahim, alayhi salam, the prophet, Abraham, you can't turn your back to the Kaaba and survive. No, not as an Arab. And this is what we did. That's right. We turned our backs to the Kaaba when we faced Jerusalem for 17 months. So now we ask ourselves, these two things happened in Shaban, the second Shaban. Number one, change in the Qibla. Number two, the change of the law of fasting. Why now? Why not before? We pointed out on the last occasion that something else happened. In fact, two more things. We're not sure whether it took place in Shaban, that same Shaban. It could have occurred maybe a little before but about the same time. Number one, that Allah had previously prohibited us from fighting. We're not allowed to fight. Passive resistance. But now this is Shaban, and next month is going to be Ramadan, the second Ramadan in Medina, and on the 17th day of Ramadan, correct me if I'm wrong, I believe it was the 17th day of Ramadan, we'll have to fight the battle of Badr. And then Allah sent down revelation to, for, uh, permitting us not only to fight, but making it obligatory to fight. Kutiba alaykumul kital. So the Security Council of the United Nations could pass whatever revel, re resolution they want to pass. Allah's law is the supreme law. You can pass whatever laws you want to pass in the parliament of Trinidad and Tobago. We don't care two peanuts for your law when your law is in conflict with God's law. Shall I repeat that? 
you can pass whatever law you want in your parliament. But if your law is in conflict with God's law, we don't care two peanuts for your law. We'll follow Allah's law. So now, kutiba alaykum al kital. Fighting is now made obligatory for you. And this is about the same time that the Qibla is changed. Turn away from Jerusalem. Turn to Mecca. This is our Qibla. That remains their Qibla. They still have to turn to that Qibla. That's not our. Our Qibla is here. I told you I used to make this mistake when I was a younger man. But I've now corrected myself. I said that when Allah changed the Qibla, that one is no longer a valid Qibla, for, even for them, but I was wrong. No. When he changed the Qibla, this is our Qibla, and that is theirs. Yes, that's the mistake I made, and I corrected myself. When you make a mistake, <laughs> you must correct yourself, okay? I'm sending this message to my students after Allah takes me away from this world. So now, we have a new Qibla. We have a new law of fasting. We have a law making it obligatory to fight. And all of these things are taking place at the same time. Something is going on here. What is it? There's one more thing. And I have to spend the remaining time now to try to explain one more thing that happened about this time. Why were the Jews there in Medina in such large numbers? Why were all their rabbis there? La Chem, la Chem, the best of the, the intellectual heart of the Jewish world was there. In Medina, in Arabia, shall I remind them of it? What were they doing there? Answer, they knew that the Lord God was sending someone in that city. And they thought that he would be the Messiah. Because they had rejected Nabi Isa alayhi salam, Jesus, the son of the Virgin Mary. They, they rejected him as the Messiah. Some of them accepted accepted him as a messiah. But the establishment rejected him. So they thought that maybe it was the messiah who was coming in Medina. That's why they were there. Yes, that's why they were there. But when someone came from Mecca and declared that he was a prophet of the one God, and he's preaching that there is only one God. And with him there is a book which is being revealed. And this book is speaking a lot about them, the Jews. Oh, yes. There's a lot in the Quran pertaining to them. And he's saying that the Lord God has sent me to all of mankind, including you. Ya ayyuhan nas. Inni Rasulullahi ilaykum jami'ah. This is in the Quran. O oh, mankind, I am the messenger of Allah sent to all of you. All of you. But they had a problem. What was their problem? The Quran said they could recognize him as a prophet of God the way they recognized their own sons. And yet, they had a serious problem. What was the problem? Answer. I have a book entitled The Religion of Abraham and the State of Israel, a view from the Quran. Um, you can order it from Trinidad. We don't have it in Malaysia at my bookstore, but we can ship it to you from Trinidad. We still have some copies. And in that book, I have explained this problem. What was the problem? The problem was this. Based on what they have found in the Torah today, if Muhammad 
Allah's blessing be upon him, who is not a Jew, he's an Arab, if he is indeed a prophet of God, then the Torah is filled with lies. If an Arab can be a prophet of the one God, then the Torah is filled with lies. So, in order to retain, to hold on to the integrity of the Torah, they were forced to say, no, he can't be the prophet. No. But they decided to test him. In fact, it was a trick. And they were hoping that he'd fall for it. They brought two people who had confessed to adultery. <clears throat> In the Arabic language, it's called zina. Zina. They brought two people who had confessed to adultery. And they said to him, O oh Muhammad, alayhi salatu waslam, you judge what should be the punishment. They were trying to set a trap for him. And uh, the Prophet, alayhi salatu waslam, responded and surprised him. He asked, what punishment do you give for those who confess to adultery? There's no need for evidence, eyewitnesses, when someone has confessed. So they replied, and they said, well, we paint their faces black and we beat them. And then he stunned them when he asked, is this the law in your Torah? Today it's called the Bible. Is this the law in your book? Bring the Torah. Now they caught something called coal feet. They are sweating cold because they, 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 the Australians call it boomerang, something you throw it, they come back to you. Boomerang, is it? Boomerang, yeah. So they set a trap for him, and it's boomeranging on them because they're going to have to bring the Torah now. He says, bring the Torah and read, meaning I can't read. You have to appoint someone to read, to recite from the Torah. That passage in the Torah which deals with the punishment for zina or for adultery and fornication. But the chief rabbi, the head of all the rabbis in Medina, had taken the shahada and had accepted Muhammad والسلام, as the prophet of Allah and accepted the Quran as the word of Allah. His name was uh, Abdullah bin Salam. And he is standing there with the prophet والسلام. Their rabbi is with Muhammad so they brought the Torah, and they appointed someone to recite from the Torah the passage dealing with the punishment for zina or adultery, or fornication. But when the man came to that verse which deals with rajam, which is stoning to death as the punishment in the Torah, stoning to death, which is the punishment in the Torah for adultery. He put his finger on it. He read over it to conceal it. Abdullah bin Salam, who is standing by, who is the rabbi, who has now become Muslim, he said, stop. My gosh, there must have been silence, eh? Suspense. He says, raise your hand. So the man has to raise his hand and uncover the eye. Now read. And so he had to read that although they said that our punishment is that we make their faces black and we beat them, the Torah was saying something else. The Torah said that the punishment for adultery was stoning to death. So now they're caught. 
What to do? Their book says one thing, and they're doing something else. So maybe they started to stammer. You, 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 you know, you know, you know, stammering because they're caught. And then they explain, you see. They said, when the small people committed adultery, we would stone them to death. But when the big fellas committed adultery, we couldn't do that. So what we did was to make a new law that we could apply on everybody. And this new law has been in force for hundreds of years, generations now. No one has ever been stoned to death. No. We've abandoned that law in the book. At that time, the Prophet ﷺ then gave the order that the two people who confess to adultery must be stoned to death. They asked him to judge. And he judged. And he judged in accordance with the law of the Torah. The Jews were stunned. Here was evidence as bright, as dazzling as the sunshine. This man cannot be but a prophet of the one God. But there is additional evidence. This man turned his back to Mecca, an Arab, and turned to our Qibla. Jerusalem to pray. This also was evidence as dazzling as the sunshine. He had to be a prophet of the one God. And this man was fasting with us for 17 months. In accordance with the law of fasting in the Torah, fasting on the days when we fasted, in accordance with our law. No Arab ever did that. This also was evidence as dazzling as the sunshine that this man had to be a prophet of the one God. But no. Despite a mountain of evidence, they still could not accept it. Because if we recognize Muhammad, Allah's blessing be upon him, as a prophet of the one God, the implication is that our book, the Bible, is filled with lies. So now they conspired. Their usual response conspired to destroy the power of Islam. What they did was, prior to the religion of Islam being accepted in Medina, there were two major Arab tribes in Medina, pagan Arab tribes, who were enemies of each other, and generation after generation, they're fighting with each other. This one was called the Aus, and this one was called the Khazraj. And uh, poetry played a very important role in Arab society. So the poet will, will compose poetry in praise of Aus and against Khazraj. And the poets on this side will compose poetry in praise of the Khazraj and against the Aus. And they will use poetry to inflame the hearts. And so the hatred and enmity and rivalry will be intensified because of poetry. So they decided on a strategy. They would wait until the two tribes were together in the same place, the leaders of the two tribes. And they sent one of their best poets, the Jewish poets, to go and recite poetry in praise of this side and against that side. And then recite poetry in praise of this side and against that side. And the poetry had its magical effect. 
And pretty soon these two tribes and their leaders who had become Muslims, and Allah had caused their hearts to be reconciled. Allah reconciled their hearts and big, they became brothers to each other. And now because of this stratagem, the feelings of hatred for each other began to be revived in the hearts. And they began shouting against each other. The rivalry came back to them and they were almost on the verge of fighting with each other because of this Jewish stratagem. You don't want peace, you want war. But when the Prophet ﷺ was told, he rushed and he reached in the nick of time to stop them. They even conspired to kill the Prophet ﷺ. Allah was waiting for this. Allah was waiting for that moment when Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam would go to Medina and be in their midst, waiting to see whether they will accept him or reject him, waiting to see whether they will accept the Quran or reject the Quran. And when it became plain and clear by the second Shaban in Medina that they had rejected Muhammad alayhi salatu as the prophet of the one God, rejected the Quran as the word of the one God, and were now conspiring to destroy Islam and to kill the prophet sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam. It was at that moment that Allah acted. He was waiting, waiting, waiting for that. And his response was to change the Qibla. So long as we had the same Qibla with them, we constituted one community. Muslims and Jews were one Ummah. But now when the Qibla is changed, we are a separate Ummah from them. And when the law of fasting is changed and we're given the fast of Ramadan, do you understand that the fast of Ramadan came, first of all, to consolidate this ummah, that we are going to build ourselves as an independent community following Allah, not following parliament. Parliament could do what you want. You can pass any laws you want. You could say she has to be 25 years of age before she can be married. And next year you can say a man can marry another man and get a marriage certificate. We don't care two peanuts for you. This is Ramadan. The month of Ramadan has come to get the world of Islam together as one community. And so when Ramadan comes and we fast together, Remember, we are brothers to each other. When Ramadan comes, remember, Ramadan has come to make us strong and powerful. And we can be strong and powerful only if we follow Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam. And we do not follow that godless world. Are we doing that? That is a question to be asked another day. If we follow Muhammad alayhi 